Welcome to Generation Impact Bible College. Uh, we are covering topic 42 tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to this evening. We're excited to hear what God has got to say. Uh, we're trusting God for touched lives, people that will be able to move out in the anointing and uh, do the things that God wants you to do. See the things happen that God has purposed for your life. All these training sessions that we put together, we are hoping to equip you for a time and a season like this so you can do the work that God has called you to do. So, so just get your Bibles together, come together, sit down and come and participate and, and be active in, in what God is doing tonight. So let's just open the session in prayer quickly. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to once again come study your word, learn from you, Father, sit at your feet and be able to receive everything that you have for us, Lord. We thank you, Father God, the word cannot return void, but it shall accomplish absolutely everything that it's sent out to do. Father, it will cut between bone and marrow. And Father God, tonight we thank you that as people hear the word and they look upon it and they gaze upon it and they see, it, see their image in what the word is portraying, Father, they'll be quick to adjust and to change and to become the vessel that you want them to be. So Lord, we're excited. We ask you to uh, anoint our lips, anoint our mouth, anoint our thoughts, Father God, and let us speak only that which the Spirit of God has ordained and purpose for this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Pastor Leslie Hessel, so I'm going to carry, cover a topic about grace tonight. Uh, it's number 42 for the students that have already signed on. By the way, if you have not yet signed on for Generation uh, Impact Bible College and you're not one of the official students, I'll encourage you to do that. Um, there's, the student body is growing every single day and we're excited to see the spread and the people that are actually coming in and learning and listening and becoming that which God has purposed them to do. We want to unlock the full potential of what God has got for you and for your life that you can achieve and accomplish absolutely everything that he has ordained for you. So tonight we're going to start off with uh, grace and uh, this topic has most probably been a topic that's been uh, preached and spoken about a lot over the last couple of months, uh, maybe even years. And uh, we're hoping to, to help you guys with that tonight and to maybe answer some of the, the questions and things that, that you might be contending with and dealing with. Let's start out. The word grace, um, most probably one of the most popular definitions of grace, unmerited favor, unmerited advantage, unmerited or, or you know, um, situation for, you, for every believer. So that grace definition comes predominantly out of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the grace definition, although there's a lot of favor in there, and Paul spoke about grace mostly most out of all the apostles and people that, that were involved in authoring the Bible. And uh, he brought this concept of not only having um, a, a favor element to it, but he also brought the whole thing about being empowered, an empowering element. And uh, I like something that a person has written. I, I, they didn't put their name with it. And I just want to read this to you as an introduction. I thought it was, it was quite a nice intro and a nice thing. It says, grace in simple terms is God's unmerited favor and supernatural enablement and empowerment for salvation and for daily sanctification. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Grace is what every man needs, what none can earn and what God alone can and does freely give. Then it carries on to say grace addresses man's sins while mercy addresses man's misery. The gift of grace makes men fit for salvation, miraculously making <clears throat> separated strangers into God's beloved sons. Awesome, awesome little paragraph that this particular person had written. He never put his name with it, so I'm not exactly sure. I can't give him the credit for it. But that definition helps us to understand what grace is about. Grace is unmerited favor, but at the same time, it's an enablement and an empowerment. And I think Paul took those two components at the end and brought them through. So, so if you look at grace then, there's really two elements to it. One part is the sanctification and the salvation side, which, which is the unmerited side. And then you've got the side, which is the enablement and the empowerment, which is the portion that allows you and I to function and to do the things that God is wanted, uh, wanting us to do. Um, you can most probably in a certain way also compare it to the anointing, which is 
is the enablement and the empowerment and God showing His power and presence upon our lives. So we have to understand then that, that grace has really got two main dimensions. And that is what we're going to focus on tonight and what we're going to look at as we go through this particular topic. So let's look at the grace and the salvation side first. We are only saved because of grace. We find that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. And let's read that. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So it is God's mercy and grace and love that was poured out to you and I, that's allowed you and I to come into a place where we can enjoy and receive the salvation that God has given us. Now that salvation is, is some people might ask, what is this, what are you saved from? What is the salvation? It is a, a, a ensuring that you do not have to live an eternal life separated from God. You saved from that. You are brought into a eternal relationship with the Almighty God. So that whole salvation thing comes into being because of what Jesus did upon the cross. Now, God loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross, to shed His blood, to deal with this issue called sin. Now, even that little paragraph I read for you earlier on, Enhance the fact that grace predominantly deals with the sin issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So it deals with the sin issue so that you and I can come into relationship with God. Remember, sin and God cannot cohabit the same space. When God comes, sin dies, sin leaves. That's why sin had to be dealt with. And because of that grace that God demonstrated and showed to you and me, you and I are able to now enjoy that relationship. We <clears throat> we fall from grace if we, sorry, we fall from this grace if we replace Christ with laws and rules. You'll find that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, which says you have become strangled, or sorry, you have become estranged from Christ. You have a you who have attempted to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So when you and I try to come into a place where we try to live our Christian life on our own, through our own strength, through our own ability, applying laws and rules, taking that which was from the law into our lives, the minute that you and I do that, then we are taking the position of God. And according to this scripture, we then become estranged from Christ. And we have been, we, we're trying to justify, us, justify ourselves by law. And when we do that, we fall from grace. So we cannot make, work out our salvation on our own. We cannot make our salvation work for, uh, you know, work out for us. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit. We have to depend on God to do the work in us. You know, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit who comes in and partners with us, there is no ways that you and I can enter into a permanent relationship with God. It is through that effort and that um, work that the Holy Spirit does. In other words, God himself through the Spirit of God comes into you because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He comes and he inhabits us and he lives with inside of us. And because he does that, he works out the perfect will of God in our lives. That's why you and I can then come into his presence with boldness and with confidence. And when we do that, the grace of God abounds to us. He comes through and he does a perfect work within us because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And because he does that, he does the work. You and I have to come to a place of surrender to that grace, that unmerited favor, that empowerment, that enablement. So when he comes in and he starts doing the work inside of us, that is when we can step into the blessing of the Lord. Now I believe that the unmerited favor is what reveals and shows the blessing of the Lord to you and I. It is when you and I look into the, into the Word of God, when we look into what the Holy Spirit has achieved for us, what Jesus did upon the cross, everything, that, that whole package, that whole deal according to Scripture, that is when the blessing of the Lord comes upon us and He makes us rich because of what He has accomplished and what He has done. And you and I, all we have to do is receive the gift 
We have to receive the gift of grace into our lives. And as we receive the gift of grace into our lives, we apportion all these things to us. Because the sanctification, which is the, the dealing with your soulish area, your mind, your intellect, your thinking, all those things, those things that motivate your attitudes, when you allow the Holy Spirit in to start working on those things, and He starts enabling you and I and empowering you and I, that is when we start enjoying the fullness of the grace that's been apportioned to you and I. So you and I have to get into that place. We have to get into that place where we seek after that. We press in. We want to become more like Him every single moment of every day. We, 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 we push towards the holiness even as He is holy we push towards that place so that we can receive the fullness of what he has died on the cross for so we can enter into that unmerited favor you know even if you look at the old testament all the the prophets of old you know whether you look at noah moses uh any one of them doesn't matter when you look at them you can see how the unmerited favor worked in their lives if you look at, at moses and how god blessed him and how god increased him if you look at abraham and how god blessed him and how god increased him and how the people around him benefited from his blessing jacob isaac the whole lot it is amazing how it worked so you and I become vessels of that grace. We start showing that grace to the, 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 the world, to the people that are out there. And because we do that, we allow that grace to come through. So if we then look at that, we have to understand then how the empowering side and the enabling side of it works. And that is what helps you and I to function in the things that God has called us to. Those things that you and I have to do in this world, you know, Remember, we do not live for ourselves anymore. We have become a, we sacrifice our bodies, which is a good, what we do, Romans 12. And we look at what Paul said in Galatians uh, 2.20, that it's no longer he that lives, but it's Christ who lives in him. So you and I have to understand that, that as we are on this world and live in this world, it is temporary. And it's not for our agenda and what we do, but it's for God and building His kingdom, bringing as many people together into the kingdom so that we can move forward into the things that the Lord has purposed and planned for not only us, but for all mankind. So we need to understand that and know that. So the functioning becomes critical and we have to work on that so everyone has a gift to minister if we look at 1 peter 4 verse 10 it says as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god so we the gift that we have remember jesus came to serve the same thing is expected from you and i a minister is a servant. So we are expected to serve. We are the ones that are expected to go out and to make a difference. How do we do that? We do that with the gift that God has given us. We take that gift. So it's important for us to, to get to know what that gift is. Because as we learn what that gift is, we are able to then function in that gift. We are able to take the grace of God, which has been poured out upon us, and to make a difference in His body. Therefore, extending that grace and showing it to others. So we have to understand that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7 reads, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. One in this manner and another in that. So in other words, we're not all the same. We are not all doing the same thing. But like your physical body needs fingers, hands, toes, legs, etc. Organs, whatever. As you look at your physical body and the makeup of that, we're all part of, the, uh, we're all part of Jesus' body, the body of Christ. And because we are part of the body of Christ, we can enjoy the fullness of that grace and we can put it through and allow it to work in the body for the body, but through the body to a lost and dying world. So we can allow that grace then to abound within us. Each person, person's gift to function is unique. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 says, According to the grace of God, <clears throat> which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have, made, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. All right. So in other words, 
We're not playing for ourselves. You cannot be selfish. You cannot take that which has been given to you and use it only for your benefit and for your immediate family or circle of friends. When we embark on the journey with Christ, when we start working and for Him and with Him, we are building a kingdom, and it's the kingdom of God, <clears throat> kingdom of Christ. And because we are building that kingdom, and because we are building that, that whole place, everything we do, we have to consider others. And therefore, we cannot go ahead and just do whatever we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. So we build, keeping in mind that we are building the body of Christ. The Bible tells me there's a wisdom in a multitude of counsel. So my grace is unique. That which God has graced me with, that which God has given me, is my gifting and God, the way God wants to use me. So now you've got the person next door, another man or woman of God. They will be called maybe as a team. One will put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. So they get to work together. And as they get to work together, so they start benefiting one another and benefiting the kingdom of God. And by doing that, they're expanding the kingdom of God and they're bringing a synergy into effect that allows the uniqueness of their gift to benefit the others that are there. You'll find very often when you get involved in ministry, there's tasks and things that God lay ahead of us that you're not going to be able to accomplish unless that complementary gifting comes alongside of you. I've seen it happen time and time again when, when there's been a synergy and a team effort that's come together to extend the grace of God and to be able to bring the things that God has purposed and planned for this time into being. So we have to use that enablement that God has given us. Now, that unique gift that God has placed in you and I, there's different ways that that can be revealed. You can get into a quiet time with God. You can seek Him. You can spend time with Him. And He can reveal it to you through His Word, through whichever way. Or there could be the laying down of hands of the elders, which they can prophesy and they can speak God's will into your life. Those words you need to take and you need to write them down. Even today again, I heard of people that, that had been given prophetic utterances in their lives and when they were given utterances how those things manifested to the letter as they were spoken many years 25 26 years later 26 years later they are living out the prophecy that was given to them 24 years before 25 years before so those prophetic words unlock destiny and purpose in us it it brings that gifting upon us. And as it does that, that grace is imparted into our lives. With that comes the favor. With that comes the provision. With that comes everything that is needed to make that grace live out in your life. So then you go, look, we must identify what our grace is by seeing what naturally uh, ticks our, or flicks our switch, sorry, or by prophetic placing. Our portion of grace is equal to our level of faith. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 it says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. I was speaking earlier today to, uh, to another class that I was lecturing about how we are all given a measure of faith according to Romans 12. And that faith needs to grow and it needs to develop. And there's many ways and tactics and means you can do that. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So by studying the word and allowing the word entrance, it builds your faith and your faith can be strengthened and it can be enlarged. So the faith that you started with is not necessarily the faith that you're going to end with. You can also find through Jude 20, praying in other tongues, you can build up your most holy faith. So by developing your faith and growing your faith, you're coming to a place of, 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 of strength in Christ, if I can put it that way. And by doing that, we release that grace, that anointing, that faith in us that allows us to bring the change that is necessary. So you and I, yes, we are given a measure of faith. And yes, depending on how we are spending time in the Word, how we are spending time with Christ, how we are conducting our lives, will depend on how that faith grows. And as that faith grows, your gift, that which God has given you, that empowerment that God has placed within you will grow and it will establish. I've seen many ministries that start small. But as they start getting into it, as they start working on it, as they start developing it, 
seeing that that the gifting grow you'll start seeing that that grace increase and multiply so i believe with all my heart that there are people that are watching uh, this recording tonight that you're going to find that that there's going to be a grace explosion inside of you. Because you've had that desire burning inside of you to see God's will fulfilled. And you have not entered into the fullness of what God has provided. But tonight there's a flick. There's a trigger that's being pulled in your life. There's a flick of a switch. There's a change. There's a circumstance that's going to happen. That's going to allow you to enter into the fullness of everything that God has purposed and planned for you. Then it carries on, your gift and your grace must grow. I actually already started on that. In 2 Peter uh, uh, chapter 3 and verse 18 it says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. The more you get to know the, the Savior, the more you get to know who your, who your King of Kings is, the more you get to know who your Lord of Lords is, the more you get to know the kingdom of God and understand His involvement in your life, the more you get to understand Him, His conduct and the way He's operating, the more you will start seeing things happen in your life. God has purposed and planned such magnificent stuff for you and He's given you the grace, He's given you the enablement and He's given you the empowerment to unlock destiny and purpose inside of you to step into what God has ordained at this season at this time. All you need to do is just receive that grace, receive that gift, and as you do that, you can start entering into the fullness of what God has planned and purposed. So you must be a good steward of the gift that God gives you. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 reads, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of of God. You see, God's grace, <clears throat> um, if I can put it this way, and then this is the picture that I'll have normally using. If you look at a diamond, okay, a diamond on its own with no light around is actually, it's like a piece of glass. But you bring a diamond and you shine light directly into that diamond and you start moving that diamond with its facets and it's multidimensionality. You take that and you start seeing the colors that are reflected and refracted from inside of that diamond. It is beautiful. You can sometimes see it even um, shine up against surfaces and reflecting of surfaces. When I look at the grace of God, the manifold grace of God, and I see that, I see the beauty contained like within a diamond. And God's light comes and it shines in there and it reveals that, that beauty. And as it does that, that is why it is of value. It's a treasure. It's a gift. It is not something that we take lightly and abuse. We take that thing and we grow it, we nurture it, we develop it, we learn it, and we allow God to, to, to take it to its full being. That's why I believe that the full potential of every believer has to be unlocked and revealed to be able to see the beauty of Christ. And that's why we as believers have to work together, united, knitted together into one, to show the grace of God, to show the love of God, to show the mercy of God. Because as we show that, and as we reveal that, and as we bring that to the fore, so you're going to see that our lives are touched and changed. When they look into your life and they start seeing that manifold grace start reflecting out, they will see Christ in you. They will see His beauty reflected in you. And as that happens, you'll start entering into the fullness of absolutely everything that He's got for you and wants to show through you. So don't look, you know, there was a season in my life where I looked at grace purely as unmerited favor. So when I released my faith, I would think, yes, doesn't matter where I go, what I do, um, I, will, I will benefit from that. And I knew this, the issue of sin had been dealt with. Past, present, future sins have been dealt with. I understand that when Jesus went and did upon the cross was a complete work. That there was nothing to be added to that. All we had to do was invite the Spirit of God into our lives and allow Him to work out the, that which needs to be worked out. From person to person, that's different. So we need to make it possible for people to come, or for the Holy Spirit to come rather, into our lives and to make the adjustment to work out what Christ had achieved on the cross already. Because Jesus is not going back to the cross. There's nothing else that He has to deal with. He has done it. It's finished. 
everything that needs to be dealt with has been. So therefore, we allow the Holy Spirit into our lives to bring us into a place that we are more like Christ, acceptable unto the Father, so that we can come into His presence and know that we are welcome. As we come into His presence, we can enjoy the fullness of His grace, His manifold grace. So as we look at Him then, I came to the, to the place where I started understanding, not only does grace, unmerited favor, dealing with sin issues, but with grace, it dovetails with the anointing. It dovetails with many of the other things that God has purposed and planned for our lives to allow us to unlock the full potential of every individual and every being. When we do that, the grace abounds. And when the grace abounds, it doesn't abound only to me. It abounds to me, but through me to you. And that is what we want. That is what we're pushing for. We're pushing for our lives to be a, make a difference, not only to me, but to others. We are servants. We are people that bring the grace of God into the lives of others so that we can see the change, not only in us, but in them as well. Why? Because we want to see the kingdom of God united. We want to see the kingdom of God grow. We want to see those needy people, those lost and dying souls, to come in to the kingdom of God. Now, if we then look at it, there are, there are a couple of levels of grace, which I'll just like to cover as we start coming in towards a landing here. 2 Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 9, it reads like this. It says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amazing. Amazing how God has already extended grace, mercy, favor, love to you and I. Even before this dispensation of time began, He'd already done that. He had already poured it out upon us and made it ready for us through Christ. And we know it's not according to works. You cannot earn it. You cannot improve it. You cannot change it. You cannot pay for it. You cannot do anything. The grace is a free gift that all you and I can do is receive. We have to receive that which Christ has already provided for us. Christ made the way. Christ did everything that needed to be, do be done. So that is where we start. We start with that free gift. We start with not trying to do it in our own strength and ability. Knowing that it's a futile exercise, that the only way we can do it is to receive that which God has already done. That's the starting point. Then we need to start growing the grace. So look at 2 Peter, 2, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So you can see in that verse it makes it very clear. That you and I need to get to know Christ, every facet, every dimension of Him. We can never come to a full, uh, full understanding of who Christ is. My conviction and my belief is that when you think you know Christ, He's going to bring another surprise along the road. And there's going to be some more stuff that you and I have not yet learned and seen. We'll never fully explore everything that God is. So I believe that is, there's a journey ahead of us into eternity where we will be able to, to enjoy the grace and we'll be able to see facets of it that we never even knew existed. So don't worry, you won't outlearn Christ. But the, 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 the beauty of what is there today is that you and I need to spend time and learn more about Jesus every moment of every day, striving to become more like Him in everything that we do, in attitudes in conduct, in character, in lifestyle, more like Him. Not me, myself, and my family only. No, it's all about God's kingdom and God's people. Then we get, develop into a level of sufficient grace. So we start with grace, we then grow and sufficient grace. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, and it reads like this. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. Well-known scripture, Paul Paul having dialogue with Jesus, with God. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, the power of God, the Bible promises us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Spirit of God into your life, that you will receive power. And then the purpose of that power, the main purpose of that power is to become a witness and to share the gospel and to allow people to receive the freedom that comes with the gospel and everything that, that Jesus has provided through his, so through his death on the cross. So you and I come to that place where we need to, to really explore that which Christ is. Really explore and allow everything to come into our lives that he has purposed and planned for us. So then we enter into abundant grace. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 through 14. It says, Now thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So here we stand. There is a maturity and an abundance that we can enter into when it comes to grace. Where I believe that grace will open doors for you. It will create opportunities for you. It will go before you and it will make crooked paths straight. It will go before you and where there is no way, it will make a way. And it will allow the love of God which is shed abroad in your heart according to Romans 5.5. 5, it will take that love and it will allow you to start seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. For grace abounds not to you and I only, but it abounds through us to every other person that's out there. Every gifting, I don't care what gifting it is, that God has imparted to man has been for one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to be able to serve others. To be able to put that into their lives. To make it effective in their lives. So their lives can be impacted and changed. So they can go forward and they can be victorious in Christ. Now, victorious in Christ does not mean just financial blessing or financial prosperity. It means being victorious in every single area. Relationships. Knowledge. Wisdom. Um, obviously finance, every part of your being to be victorious. That is what the grace that God has poured out upon us allows us to enter into. Unmerited favor. Favor you don't deserve. Favor that you can't earn. And then on top of that, He empowers you and He enables you. To be sanctified so you can stand in the courts of God. Stand before the very throne of God. Because of what His grace has done for you. And it's a gift. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. And you can't pay for it. Nothing. All you and I can do is receive it. Now today, um, the Telegram group is open. And uh, if there's any questions you'd like to ask or any comments you'd like to make, feel free to go to the telegram, telegram, telegram group. This is for students that have already subscribed to, to, um, um, to the GRB uh, uh, curriculum, GRBC curriculum. Um, if you haven't, this is maybe your opportunity. This is your time. Uh, maybe it's the right time for you to be able to come to a place where where you say, Lord, I need to actually discipline myself and I need to get into a place where I can study. GRBC is the right place for you. If you come here, you just go to the website, the subscriptions and everything is there. Uh, put your details down. One of our, our counselors will get hold of you and uh, basically embark you. As You can start anytime. The, the way the curriculum has been structured is that it doesn't matter when you start. <clears throat> you can start at any point in time and work through the thing uh, over a four-year period. That's a complete program. And then, of course, you can, you can chop and change during the year if you need to for whatever reason. So <clears throat> just checking to see if my moderators here have got any messages on the Telegram groups yet, um, if there's anything that needs to be discussed or spoken about. Uh, let's have a look. 
All right. Um, okay, I'm just looking here. Okay, these are questions regarding that. Sure, I can I can share that part again quickly. Um, it's on a website that I found a while ago, and I copy and pasted the paragraph out of there. I did not even keep it, but I'll read it slowly for you um, so you can hear it. It reads like this. It says, Grace, in simple terms, is God's unmerited favor and supernatural enablement and empowerment for salvation and for daily sanctification. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Grace is what every man needs, what none can earn, and what God alone can and does freely give. Grace addresses man's sin, while mercy addresses man's misery. The gift of grace makes men fit for salvation, miraculously making separated strangers into God's beloved son. Awesome writing there really loved it when i read it <clears throat> okay that is a paragraph from the unknown author okay sorry that that was what i've just read now um yes grace has come under criticism for licentiousness because there is a teaching going around where people have taken grace and they said the unmerited favor and all that they they made it as if you can um, you know, God's the, the 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 phrasing that they like using is they say that the sin is, your sin has been dealt with, for past, present, and future. So they use that argument and that logic, and they build on that, obviously using scriptures and stuff like that, where they then say that because your future sin has been dealt with, um, you you don't have to be worried. But what they do not tell you is that two things. The one thing they don't tell you is that listen, at the end of the day, <clears throat> sin and God can't cohabit. Don't play with the boundaries of grace. Where does grace stop? Where does God say enough's enough? Time out. So to try and take it to that kind of point is dangerous. And yes, you know, if you fall into sin, that is great. Grace is there. That if you fall into sin, it's not of your own purpose and because of what you've done. But say you fall off the wagon, something went wrong. I believe God's grace is extended to you to come to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. I made a mistake. I repent. You turn around, you walk away, and by repenting, God says you are brought back into right standing with Him. And I believe everything goes ahead. But you should have done a 180 degree turn. Now, I do believe that maybe a while later, if you do fall off the wagon again, but you've, you've had a heart not to, but you do fall, the grace is going to be there again. But I don't want to be, I don't want to tempt God. I don't want to get to a place where, where I try and live a life that is that is um, not holy um, not consecrated not dedicated and when I do that I land up in a place of compromise and yes there has been a, a message of grace that is that is sort of like promoted or allowed licentiousness or made sin okay that you know you can deal with it and I don't believe that's of God I believe that we need to live a pure and holy life I believe that we need to live a life consecrated to God I believe there's consequences to every action doesn't matter what you do there's going to be a day of accountability there's a day of judgment coming the the Bible makes it very clear that when we stand before him one day our works will be judged and when that happens um, there's going to be rewards handed out I don't want to stand there empty-handed I'm not going to live just a life any which way so I'm going to be, live a life with purpose and plan. When I stand before him one day, I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to stand before him and know that I've done everything that I can do to accomplish the call that he placed upon my life so that I can stand before him knowing that I've made every effort. So yes, there is, there is um, that teaching that gives, creates the impression that you've got a license to sin, which I don't believe is true. Any other questions tonight before we close? Um, the wages of sin are death is death rather and I do believe that everybody will be held accountable there's no doubt about it and what people don't understand is sin can, can kill there's absolutely no doubt about it okay alright that's about it can we close in prayer 
Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time, Lord. And I thank you that the word cannot and will not return void. But it will accomplish absolutely everything that's been sent out to do. Lord, I pray that it will find, find fertile ground, take root, develop, bear forth much fruit, where people can come and feast of what the word has accomplished in the year's hearts. So, Lord, we thank you for that tonight in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.